Once again, my next guest picked up another big win, this time getting it done over Max Griffin at UFC uh, Columbus back on March 26th. It's Neil Magny back here on the program. Neil, how are you, man? I'm doing great, man. How are you? Doing awesome. Uh, we're a couple days, well, more than a couple days removed from the fight. It looked like the game plan uh, went according to plan in this one. Is that accurate? You ended up getting the win, but I got to know anyways. Um. Yeah, so I initially thought that Max was going to kind of um, come out very aggressive and kind of hold the center of the octagon. Um, but he came out and he was very like uh, evasive. Like, he was kind of riding on the outside a little bit and like forcing me to like uh, chase him down. And um, he was doing a good job of countering me as I was trying to like close the distance on him. Um, so I had to adjust midway through and just realize like, you know what, I can't just like have this technical bow and allow him to like control the outside and kind of have, just have like fight close, which is usually the exact opposite of what I try to do. Um, so I have to make it like a close range fight and pretty much pitch him up, get him to the ground and uh, try to find a submission or TKO that way. You know, in the first round, uh, didn't make it easy on yourself. I know you got hit there. I, I mean, that's kind of been something throughout your career where you're able to sort of persevere. How hurt were you in that first round? Um, it was a pretty good shot. He definitely knocked me off my feet uh, there for a second, but um, it wasn't so severe where, like, I didn't know where I was at, what was happening, that kind of thing. Um, it was just a good shot, uh, well-placed, good timing on it. Um, but I wasn't aware the whole time. And then, uh, like, that was kind of a, a changing point for me in the fight when they got that knockdown, and I realized he didn't engage on the ground. Um, it made it evident, like, what his game plan was. Um, and from there, I was able to just kind of, like, start chipping away and, and uh, find my way to win. So it goes to the judges' scorecard, somewhere you've been a lot of times. Were you confident uh, that you had the decision? How are you feeling going in in there uh, once they were reading the scorecards? Yeah, I was definitely pretty confident that I had got it done. I mean, um, especially in the second and third round. I mean, it was obvious that uh, I lost the first round. Uh, there's no arguing that at all. Um, but I definitely felt that I uh, was definitely the, the more aggressive fighter, the more um, fighter I was in control of the fight going to the second and third round. Were you worried at all after the first? I mean, you've you've come back and won fights before, but did, wh how are you feeling going into that second round after you knew you dropped the first? Um, honestly, I wasn't too worried about it. On the scorecards, like in my mind, I knew I could submit uh, Max Griffin, and that's kind of what I was going for. So even losing the first, I was still kind of like, all right, whatever. Like I, I can still submit this guy. Not a not a big deal. Um, I can go out there and get it done still. So um, it was never like, oh my god, I lost the the first round. What am I gonna do now? I, I was super confident that I could like. I actually said Max Griffin, so um, I didn't hesitate or worry about it at all. After the fight, love the call out. Got to admit, you call out Chimaev. I know some people will be like, why would you call out a guy who's got a fight book? But it doesn't matter. He's like the biggest name in the division, maybe outside of the champ or Colby. But still, like, uh, how how rehearsed was that? Because I thought it, the delivery was probably one of the best call outs you've had post fight. How much did you practice that? <laughs> honestly that was just me on the fly just uh really you're a natural neil i thought it was good maybe pro wrestling's in your future we'll see <laughs> yeah dude i mean i got a power bomb in the fight and i was able to close out with a good call out i mean in my book that's a win-win <laughs> how much did his fans come after you on social media after the fact did you get a lot of the the chimaya fans yeah, and of course, we got the, the wolf emojis on everything that I will post right now. But uh, I guess there's a, another I'll be coming on the feeding fight in the, in the Wall Street division that guys want to see me fight. So um, I'm going to totally botch his name. So I'm not going to bother trying to say it. But uh, <laughs> there's another uh, uh, that a lot of guys seem to want me to fight. So, the name I think you were talking about there is uh, is Shavcat, right? That's the guy that they're calling him sort of the other Chimaev, like this, uh, the guy who's been, you know, finishing everyone, I think like 100% finish rate. Um, were you familiar with him when you saw him call you out on social media? Um, I've definitely seen him fight before. Uh, it wasn't the guy that like, I particularly like followed or like uh, was on my radar, so to speak, as a, as a potential opponent or matchup or anything like that. Uh, but after the, uh, um, the fight, once he had to call out, I mean, it, his goon squad did a good job of making it notice that he was calling me out. I mean, I couldn't post a picture or make a comment without a thousand flag emojis being like links or whatever <laughs> I posted or whatever else may be. So um, they made it very clear that uh, they, they want that fight to happen. Yeah, for sure. Is that a fight that interests you, though? Because in terms of the rankings, I mean, I know Griffin wasn't ranked, but I know you want to sort of look ahead here. Uh, you're ahead of him technically in the rankings. Is that a fight that interests you? 
I mean, at this point, if, I don't even know if, he, if he's ranked top 15 at all. Like, at this point, I just want to fight a ranked opponent and keep moving forward. I mean, um, I took a big risk of fighting a dangerous opponent like Max Griffin. Um, and I just want to make sure that the fights that I'm taking uh, are actually getting me towards my goal, which is uh, being UFC champion. Like, um, do I love being active? Sure, absolutely. Uh, but at the end of the day, I want to make sure that the fights that I'm, that I'm choosing are actually lining up with my goals overall. And, and also like, I know you want to like, obviously, you know, keep active as well, but do you feel like you kind of did the UFC a favor here? Because like, you know, again, rankings wise, it didn't really make sense for you to fight Griffin. Do you feel like they kind of owe you one for the next one, especially in the form of a ranked opponent? Um, not at all. I mean, those are the things that have to figure out early on in this, in this sport or in this game that like no one ever owes you anything. So if I, uh, if I took that fight against Max Griffin, I had to make sure that like, there was some upside to it for me taking that fight. Um, I, 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 I'll never take a fight thinking that like, oh, if I do this favor for UFC, maybe they'll do me this favor in return. That's just never the way it works. And I'll be set myself for fair to have that kind of um, train of thought because I've seen it played out time and time again where um, guys took a few short notice fights and didn't play out their way. Um, and when it came to time to prove a shopping block, there was no mercy showing. I was like, no. Didn't perform your cut. <laughs> yeah. So um, when it comes to, to that kind of thing, I make sure that every fight that I take, um, there's some kind of upside to it. There's some kind of benefit to uh, me going out there. I mean, even fight Max Grimm, for example, the guy that wasn't right, but um, he was the next best thing knocking on a, a right opponent's door. He was on a three-fight win streak. Um, he had a pretty impressive win over Carlos Condit. So um, he was the next impressive thing to fight outside of a ranked opponent. And I just wanted to clarify something, because in the last interview uh, we had uh, leading into the fight, we talked about Chimaev, and I know that was a fight that, that you wanted and, and wanted to come together. And obviously you called him out after the fact. But um, I heard after that there was like a visa issue. Like, take me through, like, because was the fight like ever close to happening? Like what? I guess my my, uh, my sort of question here is like, what? Like, how close was that fight to happening? Um, it was never actually like to me, a fight is close. When we get the official email when that official email comes in and it's from Sean Shelby or, uh, or Mick Nader, Nader or whoever, and there's a, a name and a date and a location or, or, or da- uh, a location to be determined at that point, a fight is like actually on the verge of happening outside of that is just a bunch of talk and, uh, um, and hoping and wishing, like, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. there, there's definitely some, uh, verbal agreements on social media, that kind of thing where, um, I, stated I was willing to fight him. Uh, he stated he was willing to fight me as well. But um, outside of that, there was nothing official that came from the UFC to uh, make that fight official. Is Chimaev ready for Gilbert Burns uh, next Saturday? Man, that's the question everybody's waiting to find out. I mean, uh, I definitely wanted to be the guy to like kind of um, end that mystique around him. But if, uh, if Gilbert Burns does it first, I mean, more pro- props to him. Didn't answer the question, though. Do you think he's ready? Um... Dude, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm still, there's a, still a question mark in my mind. Like, how okay. does he uh, pan out against Gilbert Burns? I mean, uh, one of the things that I noticed going into this training camp for, for Chimaev is um, he did a large portion of his camp in Vegas uh, for this fight. Uh, not out in, in, in uh, Sweden with his uh, original team or, or regular team. So I'm not sure how much of a effect that's going to play on him going into the fight, um, especially watching things like um, he's sparring with guys like Sean Strickland and that kind of thing. And I'm like, you're, fight, you're sparring Sean Strickland to fight Gilbert Burns. That doesn't make sense in my mind. But, I mean, to each his own. I mean, if, if that works out for him, more power to him. But um, yeah. if I had to... Uh, bet for my money on someone, I'd probably put on Gilbert Burns right now. You know, I should redo this intro because what I didn't mention off the top is you actually had a historic uh, UFC win on the weekend with uh, getting tying GSP's record for most wins in the welterweight division. Did you know that going in? I was curious about that. Yeah, I mean, in the back of my mind, I knew there was like some, uh, like I was pretty close to getting it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like my last three, four fights now, that I was getting compared to uh, Matt Hughes and, and George St. Pierre for as far as like uh, the most wins in the Wallsway division. So I knew I was like creeping on, on up on that record. I just didn't know I quite like uh, uh, tied him until afterwards when DC pointed it out. Did GSP ever reach out to you after the win? Um, so I actually have had, uh, not after the win, no. Uh, I have spoken to him in the past uh, through coaches and that kind of thing uh, about potentially training in Montreal and that kind of stuff. Uh, but since the win, no, I haven't had much conversation at all.
We got to do something about that. He's a polite Canadian. He should be uh, reaching out and saying uh, congrats for, uh, for for tying me there. Um, as a record holder yourself, uh, what do you think? Who do you think is currently the best fighter to ever compete in the welterweight division? Is it George St. Pierre? Is it Matt Hughes? I know you used to train with Hughes. I just want to preface that. But who do you think is the best welterweight of all time? Um, if I'm giving my non-biased opinion, it would have to be George St. Pierre. Uh, I mean, the guys that he's beaten, the, the reign that he's had, uh, to be able to come back and beat every person that's beaten him, uh, to come back after two years off, three years off, and uh, fight a middleweight and get the middleweight title, I would have to say that George St. Pierre has to be the best weight of all time for UFC. And then just last thing on the fight, uh, I'm sure it was a nice post-fight celebration after the win, because not only did you win, you, your friend, your close training partner, Curtis Blades, also winning in highlight reel fashion. How cool was that night to be able to share a win with Curtis on the card for the very first time? Man, it was great. I mean, the entire fight week and everything was just a dope vibe the entire time. I mean, um, it wasn't like the normal fight week jitters that you get. It was kind of like just another day in the office, so to speak, from beginning to end. Like, um, and and for even leading up to like all fight week, all training camp, we kind of had like this uh, this energy around us where it's like, hey, I'm gonna go out there and wake up the crowd. You you close out the show, kind of thing. Um, we we kind of joked about it weeks out from the fight, but as the fight got closer and closer, uh, we kind of like started making that a thing. Uh, like I would spar before he would spar. I would uh, train before he would train. I was just kind of like. Like, kind of go out there and like set the tone so to speak and let him close it out like even in strength conditioning like we'd, I'd go in there and I'd do my sprints and do whatever and I'd be like alright it's your turn big dog let's go <laughs> and yeah. uh, he'll kind of like take the time and, and sprint off with it and uh, um, I, I think it was cool because Curtis being a headweight it's not that same competitive energy that I get from guys like Austin Hubbard or Drew Dober where like we're trying to like match each other pace for pace it's more so that energy like like hey I'm not going to drop the ball. I'm not going to like let you down. I'm, and I'm just, that kind of energy going to fight was great. Love it. That's awesome, man. Uh, so I, I, ideal return date for you. I know this is a fresh win. When would you like to have your next fight? Um, realistically, with, uh, with, the, with the way the division is playing out right now, you have uh, uh, two top ten, five fights that are happening. You have uh, recently Luke fighting Bilal Muhammad, and you have... Uh, uh, Gilbert Burns fighting Hamza Shmaya. So um, realistically, like the winner of that fight, I mean, one of those fights can see himself in tighter contention where the loser of that fight can still be ranked in the top five um, and looking to bounce back uh, early summer in the fight. So um, in the ideal world, I'd be fighting early summer against one of those four guys uh, to get myself in the top five. But at the end of the day, if UFC says like, hey, we got to fight for you. It's so-and-so. It's in three weeks. I'm there ready to fight. <laughs> And when you say early summer, would you want to get on that international fight week card that they do every year? I think it's July 2nd. Yeah, I mean, I mean that or whatever else. I mean, the other fact that it plays into a, a big, a, the other thing, I guess, it plays a big factor into it is uh, I'm also expecting my my second son in June. That's right. Uh, so my uh, home, like, welcome him back from the hospital and that kind of thing. It would be great. It would be ideal. But uh, like I said, I mean, it's not an ideal world. Things don't pan out that way every single time. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. Well, let me ask you this. You sort of talked about the two big fights that are coming up in the welterweight division, maybe fighting the loser just because of the ranking and all that. What do you think is the best matchup for you out of that group of four fighters? Is there like a good style matchup you look at out of all of them that you think, hey, that would be a really good fight for me? Um, so all of those guys pose a different threat and the thing that they do well. I mean, uh, Gilbert's a shark on the ground. Like the guy is amazing at jiu-jitsu. Um, Hamza Shmaev has great wrestling. Um, and, uh, Vicente Luque has like that, that knockout power. Uh, Bilal is just the grinder. He's going to go out there and just like do whatever it takes to win. He's going to hold on as tight as he can and just kind of drag on and make the fight, uh, play out the way he wants to and get get a win that way so um each of those guys pose their different like um skill sets and uh uh problems to solve so to speak going into it um in a perfect world i mean i guess there'll be uh fighting against specific luke just i mean and it, it, it sounds weird to say because that means i we're kind of one of those guys to lose so i can fight them but that's not the case at all uh yeah. but in a perfect world i feel like uh, the fight against Vicente Luque and I is bound to happen. I mean, um, I was scared to fight him a few years ago. That fight fell through. So um, to be able to go out there and get that fight scheduled and, and uh, uh, put an amazing show for fans, I think it'd be a great matchup.
Yeah, and I just want to remind people watching this, I'm asking the question, I'm asking what the best style match is. Like, I don't know why we can't just talk about this where people are like, he's calling him out, he's being disrespectful, you know, he deserves to get beat. Like, fans are so weird like that, man. So I just want to preface that because I'm the one asking it and I was just curious who you think the best style matchup is. It's not a disrespect thing, it's just a regular question. Okay, a couple more quick uh, news things. There's a lot going on uh, in MMA right now. First things first, um, do you think that MM, all these MMA fighters wanting to box, uh, you know, like we've heard Usman wants to box Canelo, we've heard Nagani wanting to box Tyson Fury do you think that's bad for the sport or do you think it's good that they're trying to get paid a little bit more where do you stand on that um I think that's great I mean every opportunity that a fighter has to make more money I think it's a great thing for the sport um that allows you to like kind of know your worth and, and like be okay with what you've done throughout your career I mean I've seen guys that were in this sport for a very long time and now they're retired MMA fighters in their 40s uh mid 40s early 50s and they're kind of like damn, what do I do now? Like, uh, you know what I mean? So if these guys are able to uh, go out there, do what they love, and, like, get a huge check to go with it, more power to them. I think that just brings more eyes on the sport. And it's, it's like, let's, uh, the sport grow together as a whole and sets the bar that much higher. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I can remember talking to uh, Nate Marco when I first got to the UFC, um, and we were discussing my pay, and I was like, man, I'm only getting paid 10 and 10 to fight this guy. And he's like, oh, yeah? Well, how about I got paid the exact same to fight Addison Silva for a title fight? And I'm just wow. like, what? Like, that was a thing? <laughs> like, that's yeah. crazy. Um, so, like, any opportunity that a fighter has to go out there and set the bar a little bit higher as far as, like, fighter pay goes, um, I'm all for it. More power to you. Get my support 100%. Thoughts on Masvidal cracking Colby Covington at the restaurant a couple weeks ago? Because we haven't talked since that happened. Oh, my God. Dude, that, that was just... <laughs> It, to me, that, that's, that's like taking a step in the other direction. Like, you know what I mean? Like, here you are having some great athletes doing great things, um, and then you get some nonsense like that to take place, kind of like makes the sport as a whole look bad. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we've gotten so far away from like uh, a bunch of meatheads just fighting the cage era to like being like elite athletes that are competing uh, in the cage against one another. Um, so, it's for him to do something like that, it just takes it back to like, the, the old school primitive days of MMA, in my opinion, I just think it was, uh, I just think it was low. This taste bowl was low, um, and I feel like basketball being where he's at with what he's accomplished, uh, definitely he should have known better and done better. Um, but like, I don't know, at the end of the day, I, I can't, and, and the thing to make it worse too is like he had an opportunity to fight Covington in yeah. a sanctioned fight for 25 minutes to do whatever you want. I get that man spoke about your family, I get that he um says some inappropriate things to you, but. You had 25 minutes to settle your disputes. If you didn't do it within that 25 minutes, then that's on you. An interesting timing because a week after we had Will Smith crack Chris Rock or slap him at the Oscars. W what was your take on that when you saw that? Uh, obviously, you know, Rock hit a low blow there with Will Smith's wife, but what did you make of him slapping uh, Chris Rock? <laughs> I guess he slaps these, dude. Everyone's getting slapped around right now. But uh, I mean, it's just the same kind of thing. I mean, uh, the, the biggest thing is, like, you look at a guy like Will Smith um, who did what he did. Um, I think the biggest question a lot of people aren't asking is, why? What would make Will Smith step so far to character to the point that he walked onto stage and thought it was appropriate to slap another, slap another man? I mean, um, he's been in, in the comedic scene for over 30 years now. Like, very my entire life, he's been on the, uh, the comedic scene, the Hollywood scene, uh, the music scene, that kind of thing. So it's not his first time having someone um, say a joke, which was pretty mild, in my opinion, uh, about your, your loved ones, your family. What is he going through? What's on his mind that uh, made him feel that was a appropriate reaction? Neil, always appreciate the time. Go enjoy the, the victory tour. What's left of it, I should say, uh, this week. Uh, looking forward to the next one. If there's anyone you want to thank, any sponsors, any social media, I'll give you the last word. Man, I appreciate it so much. It's always a pleasure talking to you. I mean, like always, I mean, there's things that are way bigger than me. So if you guys can, check out mission111.org. It's an organization that I work with that does missionary work in Haiti and the Philippines. Uh, so just check them out on your website or on social media, uh, mission111.org.